thank uh, Dr. Gibbs so much for coming out to Hunter for Food and Possibilities, our seventh, our eighth year actually. Dr. Smith was the uh, wonderful guest we had kick off the series in 2007, so he's kind of my good luck charm. He's been a wonderful series for so many years, and I'm just really grateful to have him back. Um, so I want to just mention briefly that um, I had this experience right before I was going off to college. I was arguing with my, uh, I won't say who it was, a relative of mine, and we were arguing about birds of all things. And I was talking about how birds had kind of intelligence I couldn't identify. I said, well, they're, they're just kind of stupid. That's why, this, that's why we have the expression bird brain. I said, I kind of wanted to get an argument with him about this. Well, well there's a whole formation of birds, and you know, each of the birds could be like a neuron in a larger mind, and I didn't know what the hell I was talking about because he had the science. So I couldn't, I couldn't muster an argument. Well, today, I'm not sure if that's going to have anything to do with what Dr. Skip is going to talk about. But I suspect it might, in the sense that we don't really know what our universe is. We think we have some ideas about it. We're getting closer and closer to being able to articulate it in a more poetic way than we could 50 or 100 years ago. The kind of the convergence of the humanities and the sciences is imminent because, in many ways, science is outstripping a discipline like philosophy. Scientists are able to, to speak in almost poetic terms about grand ideas where philosophy has lost its poetry. So, uh, Professor Skiff uh, is the director of the science, what is the name of that program again? I, I lost it. Science and Technology Studies at Bartholomew. At Bartholomew. It's probably, probably the Bartholomew. <laughs> 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 I, I have the, the, the name right in front of me, and I, I don't have it at the moment, but basically, um, He's been at Bard College for a really long time. He's worked with some of the most important scientists of the, of the last several decades, including Thomas Kuhn, who was uh, your closest one, as I recall. Well, yeah. he called me a barbarian. Right. So I, I don't know <laughs> that's, that's like a compliment among scientists, I think. I mean, I'm not sure, perhaps. Um, but the kind of um, idea of paradigm shifts in science is what is one thing that Kuhn uh, really introduced into the discussion. Um, we have a lot to talk about today. But actually mean something. And it's also related to Jesse's birds in an odd way. Let's see if this is going to work. Let me get you hooked up to the mic because we've had not a power. A little bit of a late start, but this should be fine. Uh -oh. I can just hook this on to you. Uh-oh, I'm having my RFP. That's okay, I can play for you, it's fine. Well, it's very clear. clear. It's not just the same. Okay, can I start? Where you go? Okay, here I am. Okay, what I'm going to be doing is what he said I was going to be doing. My whole point here is that I was a philosopher of science, am a philosopher of science, and a physicist, and other things. Uh, but uh, studying the two subjects together uh, gave me some problems in the mid 60s. Uh, mainly, what I'm going to argue is that somewhere around uh, the mid 60s, the conventional philosophy of science, which some of you know as a relative of something called logical empiricism or logical positivism, a wonderful <laughs> philosophy about science, which suggested that science was better knowledge than any other kind because it was uh, precise. Uh, established uh, facts, it was uh, unambiguous, a wonderful thing, it was logical, uh, this language was mathematics, and all this, all this was wonderful and fine. Problem was, as we will see, that the people who invented this uh, uh, image of science as uh, exact science were, uh, were struck by the successes of novel science in their era, particularly Einstein's relativity theory and quantum mechanics and so on. And what they wanted to do, they being uh, people like uh, Schlick and well, people with Germans with, well, uh, 
they, uh, they uh, wanted to create a philosophy of knowledge, a language that was as precise and as reliable as scientific language. And we call it the illogical empiricism sometimes, the formally received view, or I say formally because this is, this is this, by 1960, this had collapsed. Uh, but it received view encoded in logical empiricism, which was an offshoot of physics and biological positive, uh, imploded and collapsed in the mid 20th century, on my watch, as it were, and was followed by a plethora of unsuccessful repairs. When I talk about uh, logical empiricism, uh, uh, Goltz, Goltz, uh, uh, Goldman, Barbara Goldman, wrote a wonderful book on Kurt Gödel in which she described this logical positivism business as language hygiene. That is, they wanted <laughs> science and non-science to be speaking any language which the only meaningful statements that could be made in that language are, were uh, empirically or verifiable statements. Well, what happened? Well, here's the people who here's the people that did this. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Schlick and Gödel. Uh, some of you know them. Some of you don't. They are old dead people. Uh, 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 Wittgenstein and Russell and Freddie Air and Sir Carl Popper. I I have to comment. Freddie Air uh, or AJ Air. It tells everybody call him Freddy. I called him Sir Freddy. It made him mad. He was knighted by some queen or other. But that these were people who created this uh, this uh, this image of science that they thought scientists and non-scientists should adhere to in, in 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 cleaning up their language and giving their arguments. And what I was suggesting is these people built their idea of a precise, verifiable, unambiguous, logical approach to phenomena based on copying the successes of people like Albert Einstein, who had created a mathematical theory and would go out and look at this, or somebody went out and looked at the sunshine and they verified these hypotheses, wonderful things, so they would do an Einstein-like theory. Unfortunately, they didn't look very closely. What Einstein actually did was not to produce a theory at all. He, he produced uh, a principle based on symmetry, whatever that was. This is the primary title of his On the Electrodynamics of Moving Objects, known happily as the Theory of Relativity. And uh, he said, well, I'm not going to give you a theory of relativity, I'm going to give you a principle. In fact, what he was giving you was a dictionary, how to translate uh, 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 statements in physics from one reference frame to the other. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, so he's going to do that in his relativity theory. It's not actually a theory. It's a principle, I'll uh, we'll talk about that later, or not. And then uh, he got his Nobel Prize for another paper in 1905, uh, in which he allegedly invented the concept that light could be considered to be little bundles of energy, little font of energy, rather than the uh, ether waves of Maxwell. This is the title of his point, this is the beginning. And Einstein says, well, the wave theory of light, which operates with continuous spatial functions, will probably never be replaced by another theory. That is, I am not attacking the wave theory of light. I'm simply giving you a heuristic. What the hell is a heuristic? A heuristic is a fairy tale. It's a lie. It's a story which actually isn't true, but it's very useful. Plato made them up when he started talking about Atlantis. He says, we never had any island called Atlantis. But pretend for a moment there was, and I'll tell you the story about Atlantis, and that will tell you something about your Greek, your Greek history. So what he's talking about is a heuristic point of view through the emission of transformation of light. That is, he's not saying that light is made of particles. He's saying, if we pretend they are, we will violate the laws of physics, but we'll get useful calculations. He went on in 1907, uh, this is sorry, bad print, to do the same thing for sound. He talked about, uh, uh, about when you bang on a, on a bell, the bell rings. And the sound, what's the sound all about? And he said, well, instead of looking at this as vibrations of a solid, look at these vibrations of a solid. It said, pretend they are particles of sound, phonons, as we now call them. They are obviously fictional. How big is a photon? Zero size. How big is a phonon? Zero size. Well, don't worry about it. Well, there's these photons bouncing through this room as I'm spitting them out. These little particles of sound are going out there, bouncing off your ear bone and making you hear. That's Einstein's heuristic. Is that true? Not, not on the hairy chin chin chin. Then he goes uh, to his general theory of relativity, which is also not a theory, 
but another principle. As he said, I am building this, this theory on epistemological principles. What he's going to say is scientific theory is an epistemological philosophical approach to the world. That is, it's a theory of knowledge, not a theory of the world, but a theory of knowledge about the world. As he, as a committed Kantian, would like to say, we have no clue as to what's out there. All we can do is uh, create uh, is create a understanding uh, of what might be out there in order to see what happens. Now, now the 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 uh, philosophers didn't read that. They didn't read Einstein's paper. They weren't really good scientists, so they just took the their high school teachers' word for it that there was a theory and a prediction and a confirmation. So if you didn't if that wasn't bad enough, you could always go to Niels Bohr. Bohr also, in 1913 and 14, had a successful Bodum theory of the atom. And uh, this theory of the atom was a, a wonderful theory, or heuristic, which uh, here's your little picture. You have, you have uh, in the middle, you have something called a nucleus, and in, in, around it, you have <coughs> orbiting some kind of electron. Now, the shield here doesn't exist. And you'd ask, well, what's what we're talking about? How big is an electron? Well, we call them leptons and they have no size, like the photons, like the, uh, like the phonons. They have no size. Well, they're in orbit. The size of things in orbit. Uh, 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 what, what does that mean? Well, that means they wander around here such that if anybody else tries to get in here, uh, they can't get any farther than that. Uh, and uh, what are these nuclei? Well, we'll worry about that later. <coughs> but in any case, this is Niels Bohr, and he's saying, in 1913 and again in 1927. Uh, well, you see, this idea, well, one of his ideas is these electrons in orbit follow the laws of physics as long as they're in the right place. But if they're in the wrong place, if an electron tries to go here, it, uh, uh, it, uh, it doesn't exist because the laws of physics that tells us what to do and it doesn't obey the laws of physics. So the electrons in his atom do these wonderful things. They disappear from here reappear from here and spit out a phonon, photon. Well, that doesn't make any sense. He said, yes, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, this is a heuristic. Finally, when he, in the 19, uh, when he had this theory that replaced his theory of the atom, the dreaded quantum theory, uh, uh, that he was all for it because, as he said, these ideas, uh, his idea was crazy, but not crazy enough. These ideas are really crazy, and they gave him the order of the elephant in Denmark. I don't know why the elephant is a national animal, animal of Denmark, but it's on the Carlsberg Brewery uh, uh, label, and uh, they donated money to give an order of the elephant, and they gave him an award. Here's the chain he wears around his neck. Here's the, um, here's the little elephant at the bottom. And if you win the order of the elephant from the brewery, you get to pick your own coat of arms. He picks his coat of arms as a fabulous yin yang signal, uh, uh, yin yang signal, symbol of the Orient, and he picks his slogan Contraries are complementary. That is, in this new physics, there are contradictions, there are paradoxes. Paradoxes are not things we get rid of. Logical contradictions are not things we get rid of. We embrace them, we love them, we use them. Or, if you don't like old quantum theory, we'll look at Werner Heisenberg, the new quantum theory, on which Bohr is screaming. He invents a matrix mechanics, where these so-called electrons are now actually, they don't exist. <laughs> that is, what's going around this atom are virtual pieces of the electron. This electron, whatever that is, has all of these little avatars, and the vastos as well, they go around and they do what Bohr said they did, and only, the only thing we can detect is when, when one of the avatar jumps to here, and we get, we get uh, only the jumps are detected. I detected. And he turns around the board and he says, you know, people aren't going to buy this, but this is what my mathematics says. And as he said, when in his book, Physics and Philosophy, he's talking about the confusion the, uh, of problems of the old theory of Bohr. And he said, in bad words, the final solution was approached in two different ways. Okay, uh, one was uh, uh, turning around the question. Instead of asking how can one, one in the known mathematical scheme express a given experimental situation, perhaps we should ask, it is it true perhaps that only such experimental situations can arise in nature as can be expressed in the mathematical formalism? 
Mr. Skip, I'm yeah. so sorry to interrupt. May I get you your mic with microphone? Oh. This would be a little bit better. Oh, you guys that. not? Well, yeah. that's okay. Do you have a shirt pocket? I can show this. Uh, <laughs> I can just attach it. All right. No, 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 no. Not your, not your issue. It's our issue. Don't worry about it. Right. You just keep. Uh, Testing, start on a street, start on a street, start on a street. Okay. And here's that one. Thank you, guys. Sorry about that. Okay. So, uh, so what he's saying is that he's put, put these little matrices together. You know what they were. He had to go to Max Born and here to get find out. But in any case, a, this, is, this is theoretical physics. This is science uh, without labs. This is blackboard time. Worlds on paper. He's imagining up all of these numbers and calculations and so on. And he says, now I got it. Perhaps the only thing that is out there in the world are things that are expressed in my mathematics. He is, of course, channeling Kant, but he won't admit it. Uh, uh, that, so that, uh, so, but in any case, uh, uh, imagination trumps uh, perception. OK. Well, here's the rat in the thing. Uh, Pernier, was uh, in the 30s, was uh, took up Einstein's place at uh, Oxford when Einstein uh, jumped ship and broke contract and went to Caltech, or went to actually went to broke contract with Caltech and went to Princeton, leaving uh, Prof. Lindemann with uh, uh, his young philosopher at Oxford, and he sent Freddie <coughs> off to the United States or now off to, or off to Vienna to hang out these philosophers, these guys in their 30s who were these logical empiricists and talking very important things about science, mistaken as though they may be. And uh, he said, go over there and uh, uh, go over there and find out what they're saying. Come back and tell us at Oxford what it is. And Freddie goes over, comes back, writes a book called Language, Truth, and Logic, one of the best-selling philosophy books in the early part of the 20th century, middle part of the 20th century. The book that, at least on the East Coast, explained to everybody what these precise languages had to be, what the nature of language, the nature of truth, and the nature of logic. By the way, that fortune cookie did, in fact, come to me as a fortune cookie. <laughs> Some of you will recognize the girl's problem. This guy here has this question here, causes all sorts of trouble. Up to a C. In fact, I will talk about that trouble right now. There are saboteurs in the works that will be subversive to Freddie's, oh, I'm telling you what, or Freddie went to uh, uh, um, Vienna, uh, yeah, Vienna came back out and wrote the book, and I asked him, I said, Freddie, um, what did Gertl say? Gertl's a mystery, he was a mad mathematician, a logician, in fact, he was Einstein's only friend at the Institute, and uh, and they only talked to each other, and they apparently talked weird stuff, because uh, Gertl was schizophrenic then, eventually starved himself to death, because he thought the CIA was after him. But anyway, uh, that's so unrealistic these days. Yeah, right. Well, 1936 it was. Uh, but anyway, these saboteurs uh, uh, hanging around. Ludwig Wittgenstein off in the wings, Karl Popper, a visitor to the Vienna Circle, and Kurt Gödel, a member of the circle. Each of these people by the 1940s and 50s had totally trashed the internal consistency of this wonderful map for clear, clear thinking and speaking. Wittgenstein, not in his first uh, practice, but in his logical investigation, pointed out that the precise language of science and mathematics wasn't all that precise. That language was subjective, it was ambiguous, it was imprecise. Karl Popper, who uh, they argued in science, logical scientific discovery, argued that um, uh, well, the uh, knowledge, the information we are gaining in, uh, in science, particularly the quantum theory, is, uh, is not uh, aimed at truth. Truth is not objective. Truth is not attainable. Truth would be, um, poof, we don't get truth. What we get is heuristics that get more and more useful, but less and less sensible. And of course, Kurt Gödel, who showed that mathematical logic isn't even logical. It is, not, it is not necessarily self-consistent or complete. So the uh, unambiguity of that goes. And then finally, the death of the thing came with Thomas Kuhn, who wrote the last volume in the, the Positivist Encyclopedia of Unified Scientists called The Structures Tagging Revolution, which didn't announce anything new, 
uh, and in fact, wasn't even his idea. But in any way, he uh, he argued that uh, essentially the death of the logical positivism was a mom that science did not work on principles and methods. All these changes in science did not come about by principles and methods and a reduction to uh, first principles and so on. They came by uh, uh, shared agreements that are negotiated uh, that were useful to the people at the time called paradigms, and these negotiations would inevitably break down. So these paradigms would collapse on, on an anomaly, and then you'd have a paradigm shift, and then that would collapse and keep collapsing. When asked, in his book, if you ever read this, uh, 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 his book, you've noticed that when it comes to why, why does it, why can't you get the truth? Why can't the paradigm be final? Why does it have to shift all the time? And he mumbles, he said, oh, Wittgenstein, of Woody <laughs> Allen lines. Anyway, these guys worked out. But finally, the, the, the other popularizer uh, uh, on this dilemma that, that philosophy wasn't good enough for science was uh, Paul Farab. And here's his introduction to a Chinese book against method. He's talking about scientific method. And he says, the events, procedures, and results that constitute the sciences have no common structure. There are no elements that occur in every scientific investigation but are missing elsewhere. Not every discovery can be accounted for in the same manner. Successful research does not obey general standards. It relies now on one trait, now on the other. A theory of science that devises standards and structural elements for all science activities and, uh, and authorizes them by reference to reason and rationality may impress outsiders, but it is true crude for science. So he just said what I just said. Well, I'm not the one that said that. He did. Um, but that's what I'm talking about. And. Uh, and these there is Paul Farabin, who has on his first book jacket both his horoscope and his iron cross as a, a German soldier, and various people that did this. Now, here is what is lost when these people eventually brought down the, the what would seem to be obvious to me at the time, but the, not obvious to the, else, the absurdity of these proposals of language, truth, and logic. We lost the idea of objectivity. That certainly doesn't apply to what the health scientists are doing. We lost the notion of a scientific method. As I he just said, there ain't, there ain't no method. And we lost the notion of actually theory. There are no theories that you can't test your heuristics. If I tell you a fairy tale, say, you know, that, uh, that uh, uh, Santa Claus brought you uh, your, uh, your uh, uh, ice cream cone, uh, you want to test that? <laughs> you want to uh, do an experiment to see that Santa Claus did or didn't? You lost the hypothetical deduction method, the idea that they had that you make up these hypotheses and you put out generalizations and you test them and you correct them and so on. That ain't gonna work. Uh, you lost the idea of truth as the aim of science. You lost what I like to call disambiguity, the idea that scientific statements do not contain contradictions, do not contain paradoxes. I've just shown you that the guys who invented this thing were well aware of that. You lost the idea of causality, as it turns out in quantum mechanics, you lost the idea of individuality. That is, there is no such thing as a baseball and a bat, uh, 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 and the bat causes the baseball to move, or more importantly, the proton causes the electron to rotate, or whatever the hell it does. Why? Well, in the new quantum theory, as Popper pointed out, it's probabilistic. We cannot tell you A causes B. We can talk about tendencies in groups of A's. I can't tell you what caused the nasty weather today. But the weather department says there was a 60% chance of rain today. So I brought a 60% and umbrella. <laughs> I brought two thirds of umbrella. <laughs> they tell me that the average household has two and a half dogs or cats. I only got two, so I'm not an average citizen. Okay. Clearly, when you talk about probabilities and tendencies, you are not talking about elements, yeah, electrons. You're talking about groups of something or other. No verification of predictions. I, I can't predict that the chances of rain tomorrow are 40%. Can I verify that? It'll rain or it won't rain. I, that doesn't tell me anything. Oh, you say if I had 100 days like, like tomorrow, I could say that 40% of them don't rain. Well, which 40? A and B. How can you have two days that are the same? Never. Okay, and unified science, the idea of reduction, the idea that we can all take all of these sciences and reduce them to more elementary principles or reduce them even more elementary principles. And of course, we cannot, uh, we've lost the stance that metaphysics 
religion and, 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 and philosophy and all those other things that are metaphysics, beyond physics. Actually, and Aristotle is just a book he wrote after physics. He called it metaphysics because everybody else talks about metaphysics as beyond physics. So, and you can do that. I, I, I was caught studying Kant as a graduate student and threatened with uh, expulsion from the physics department if I would continue to not dabble into metaphysics. <laughs> uh, and, and, and now it sounds to you like I'm, I'm just being mad. Uh, but uh, in any case, I wanted to point out last year uh, uh, the Department of Philosophy of Stanford University is creating a Stanford School of Philosophy. And here's the big gap of really the top uh, uh, positivists, you know, the, you know, the leftover positivists uh, uh, in, the, in the last of the 20th century, to me, and discussed the disunity and pluralism of scientific theory and practice. The nature of scientific modeling, i.e. heuristics, in its visiting variety, including mathematical, diagramic, and classificatory models. The post-positivistic and practice-based articulations of scientific knowledge and practice. Maybe if we look at science again, with these new eyes, maybe we'll figure something out. Well, they haven't yet. That, that was last year. <laughs> what happened in the 1960s, philosophers began to realize that the scientists had gone out and, and ignored them. Hi, they had to ignore them. If the scientists tried to do what they told them to do, they'd never get anywhere. So the, the, the philosophers felt ignored, so they made, made, made all sorts of patches uh, to correct uh, 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 what, the, what, the, what the flaws in their arguments were talked about. Not only did it was, uh, Inferosum, scientific realism, structuralism, construct all these isms, which were all various philosophical schools trying to fix or modify below. Bring it back, okay. That, one is, is that, oh, that was mine. I, that's in Chinese because I lost the translation. I was invited by the uh, Beijing uh, uh, Academy of Seneca to uh, comment in these matters, and I did, and they wrote it. They wrote it. I think they wrote my name, Pete. But I, uh, I, I lost the translation, so I have no idea what that said. Uh, okay. Now, part two. In the absence of a philosophy that could be understood by anybody, which they couldn't, or respected by science, which it wasn't, the general pop population began to make up popular philosophies in junk science, among which were the beginnings of this emergence theory of which I came here to talk about. The void in philosophy with the collapse of uh, uh, positivism was filled with novel ideas, not always bad, of science and history and philosophy, and we will look at a few of those. I've edited this thing down. Uh, these are various examples. Those dates are not dates that these arguments were put forth. Those are dates in which they were republished by Amazon.com, trying to show you that these are all now back in play after being languished through the year, through the last part of the 20th century. Uh, as Isaac Newton's uh, 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 prophetic uh, uh, views in, uh, in his uh, now being uncovered, he was a uh, alchemist and a mystic. And uh, so he was interested in prophecies uh, uh, and uh, he predicted that in the year 2020, the world would come to an end. But more importantly, uh, in the 1920s, uh, the books by Pilar Darchet, uh, Deschardins, which sort of begins to point to what I'm talking about, uh, emergence or Bessie's birth. Uh, the, the idea of Chardin, who was a priest, a Jesuit priest, and, a, uh, and a, an anthropologist uh, looking at uh, evolutionary systems of uh, bones. He worked on Be Beijing man when they uncovered skulls of things. He got in a lot of trouble with his church. Uh, they banished him to the ends of the earth and told him never to publish anything in philosophy and, and evolution again, and they sent him to this really remote place called Poughkeepsie, New York, <laughs> <laughs> or uh, to the St. Andrew's uh, Cemetery, where he kept his mouth shut and died, and is now buried on what is now the, uh, the uh, grounds of the Culinary Institute of Cooking. So he's yeah, buried yeah, 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 yeah. 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 the cooking school. But anyway, he wrote these books that are very popular among popular philosophers, not among Jesuits or physicists. Uh, uh, and, and the idea is that uh, as, as the species evolves, as we keep, you know, keep allowing them becoming different and different and different and different, there's a direction. Evolution is going, uh, heading some way. And he viewed an evolution of consciousness as well, that the primitive 
uh, uh, hominids were thinking in a different way than, uh, than later, uh, more concrete perhaps. And then later species, the, the, the middle ground were, were thinking uh, another way and uh, they were thinking perhaps a little bit more abstractly. And he believed that there would be a natural evolution of consciousness like the evolution of, uh, of, of phys physicalness uh, which would head in the direction of spirit spirituality. And we would all eventually, <laughs> uh, our thinking at least, would be all one great uh, spiritual uh, pay on to the uh, religiosity of the universe that repurposes itself in this crackpot here. Ray Kurzweil is now famous for talking about the, uh, the singularity, the, 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 the increase in uh, complexity and uh, uh, novel, uh, novel uh, breakthroughs in consciousness, in understanding, and uh, and eventually, uh, the beasts that do all of the consciousness will be transhuman, i.e., not us. Uh, but this is, yeah, as they say, some of these aren't, aren't that bad. Uh, others, uh, uh, others. I was going to talk about uh, 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 this one. I like Peter Fogg back in the seventies. The rise of civilization of the North American Indians. Where he was talking about again an evolution in which the uh, North American and Native Americans were. Uh, gathered in little uh, families and they ruled their, their lives according to the rules of family life. And then the families got together and they made tribes and those tribes were ruled their way uh, 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 tri tribal life. They didn't have a daddy and a mommy and a, and a puppy. Uh, they had uh, other kinds of structures. And then these, uh, some of these uh, uh, tribes got together and tried to form nations which mostly collapsed. And uh, Peter Farb argued that's because they tried to run the nations using the rules of tribes. One, yeah, I, you reminded me this morning of uh, Thucydides in the Peloponnesian War. He's talking about the Delian League, where all the city-states of, of Greece were sort of thrown in together in one particular league, tax-paying league, league. And the trouble is that the, what people were trying to do on the ground didn't have much to do with what the league thought all of their city-states should do at once. And this he views, among other things, as the Plot, the reason that uh, the classical Greece committed uh, cultural suicide in a horrible civil war. Uh, but in any case, these are other other uh, other uh, other uh, examples. I won't go into them because I was late. But these are examples of various popular and thoughtful attempts to get around uh, this business uh, of what. What is science, or anthropology, or in this case, uh, biology, or, uh, or, or, or economics? Uh, the biology, I, 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 I thought of a scheme for this thing about an example of emergence. The idea of emergence is out of a group of uh, uh, citizens comes tribes, and out of tribes become, uh, become uh, um, nations. And there's an increase in scale or complexity, perhaps, of these things. And the idea of, the idea of emergence is that as systems, physical systems, biological systems, economic systems become evolved, they become more inclusive and more complex, and the laws by which they are understood change. And the example I use is the old tiny example of caterpillars evolving into butterflies. Caterpillars is ugly, butterflies aren't. So how do you go from ugly to pretty? Happens. It's emerging that new things like beauty emerge from old things like vacuum. And so this is the idea of self-organization emergence that you start with a bunch of a bunch of black rock and you wind up with a little cage going and that uh, that uh, self-organizing system is needs to be accounted for. What happened? And uh, likewise, uh, um, well, anyway, if we go on. Why? So I get I get this thing working. Okay. Now what's next? Oh. While that was going on, while the people were making up stories of Indians and birds uh, collecting, you know, the birds are flying around and then all of a sudden they get together and take their lap. Uh, and uh, so there's been some kind of a uh, emergence of a clan uh, from a bunch of bird brains who are going on in different directions. How does that happen? Well, it turns out in the absence of the theory police, that is the philosophers, spectacular or unreasonable successes were made. Uh, other scientists uh, mathematics and technology flourished. Here's the guy I'm going to get after. The Nobel Prize in, uh, in Physics by uh, Phil Anderson. It's a while back. It was uh, in uh, the 1977. But, uh, but what, what Philip did 
was to get his Nobel Prize in describing how uh, the uh, the uh, little electrons running around in uh, in, in, in iron uh, got got to make magnets by lining up with each other, and uh, he worked out a heuristic to describe that called the field theory, and it showed a nice experimental uh, piece, but it also had a unphysical or non-real consequence. And rather than saying, oops, I'll give my Nobel Prize back, he said, well, that's the thing about models or heuristics. There are things, when we make up a model, like Santa Claus or mean field theory or Atlantis, there are things in the model that are not in the world. And there are things in the world that are not in the model. Take that, Werner Heisenberg. Uh, okay. There's a lesson from see next time when I reveal the negative entropy capacity. What he came up with is systems of negative entropy of negative absolute temperature. Now, only three of you should fall on the floor because uh, uh, you don't, the rest of you aren't physicists and don't know just how we were hanging on to the concept of absolute zero and to have cooling things down to minus three degrees and then getting adding energy and going to minus four and minus five and you get to minus infinity, which is the same as plus infinity and cooling back down uh, is uh, a little bit unsettling, but that's what he's talking about. And this is how he applied his theory in random arrangements and aligning arrangements and spin glasses and so on. And uh, so he talked about symmetry breaking. He talked about uh, a bunch of, uh, of molecules like this breaking up into molecules like this. And so the magnetism of this bunch didn't look like the magnetism of this bunch. This was quartz, where the silicon dioxide were like this. This is glass in which the symmetry was broken. And if you take quartz and, uh, and uh, try to melt it or look through it, it's different than glass. And he took spin glass where he was making a magnet uh, like that. But he said the problem is that when you change from ice or water to steam, you change the temperature and the pressure, or the pressure and the temperature from uh, uh, carbon, carbon monoxide, you found that at one pressure it was a vapor, and another pressure is liquid, another pressure is solid. But these domain walls are problematic. In fact, right here, if you take this temperature and this pressure, you get solar emitting. That's not what it is. You get what's called a critical point, a critical phenomenon, in which whatever the substance is, it is neither solid, nor liquid, nor vapor. It is none of the above. It is ambiguous. Now, the quantum mechanics say, yes, that's true. That's what we always say. Every, every description we have of an electron has different parts, what it could be. It could be this, it could be that, it could be the other thing. And what it is, is all those goodies. So that he was using very legitimate quantum mechanics in an odd way, and these are the experiments he was talking about. So this idea of symmetry breaking, or uh, going from order to disorder, or disorder order, which is the wrong way, negative entropy way, I mean, I forgot that, I got that backwards, but led to a bunch of Nobel Prizes. Uh, 77, Anderson, uh, 79, Shelley Glashow and Steve Weinberg winning a Nobel Prize for using this trick of starting with a bunch of forces and particles which were swapping around in the universe some way, and it cooled off, and all of a sudden there was a freeze out, and we got like blood or vapor all of a sudden coming into snow. That it used to be vapor and liquid, and then it got cool, and all of a sudden you have snowflakes. And like, well, you have caterpillars and you have butterflies. Then you have this symmetry breaking. And they were describing the difference between high energy and medium energy physics in terms of how these, how these caterpillar particles, these six particles and so on, uh, became, uh, or butterfly, uh, became butterfly particles like electrons, protons, and neutrons. Uh, Nobel Prize for Nanmu uh, for again talking uh, uh, broken symmetry. A Nobel Prize for Ken Wilson talking about his uh, phase transitions, the, that ambiguous place between water and air. I'm sorry, water and ice, and then, of course, a couple of years ago, uh, Peter Higgs for his invention of the Higgs field and the symmetry breaking there. And symmetry blurring. Nobel Prizes by, again, Anderson, Ilya Prigogine, talking about non-equilibrium thermo thermodynamics, a place where the second law of thermodynamics does not hold, a place where Phil, uh, Phil Anderson started talking about these things aren't physical. They don't obey the laws of physics anymore. They, uh, they believe, believe some other laws, some new laws, some, uh, some non-equilibrium thermodynamics. I remember he was standing in my office one day and I said, but that doesn't make any sense. He says, I know. I got the answer. 
You said I got the answer. Yes. Set to zero measure. And I said, of course, what's the question? <laughs> uh, uh, here's another prize for ordered phenomena, Nobel Prize in Chemistry 2011 for quasi crystals. We talk about quasi particles in physics. These are things that are kind of particles, but they're not really particles, they're like phonons. They're sort of heuristics. Uh, we'll call them quasi particles and give them a prize rather than call them heuristics in the thing. How mathematicians, you know, what language people try to cope. Renee Tom had a catastrophe or what happened in this break between ice and water, didn't work out. Brower, the, uh, oh, there's a U, I'm missing U in there, tried to talk about a mathematics which was not based on definitions but on intuition. Body was a crypto nasty, so I don't get that. Birkhoff and uh, von Neumann looking at quantum logic, some kind of a logic that didn't do the stupid things are or they're not, or you know, it's, uh, there's no ambiguity, so no paradoxes. But there are paradoxes in quantum mechanics. So they tried to create a logic that would cover those paradoxes. It bombed out. And the Japanese, about 10 years ago, were building computers on fuzzy logic, where you know, 3 plus 4 is yeah, maybe somewhere around 7 in the usually. <laughs> and that sort of thing. And there were some other ideas that did catch on. Paul Dirac, again, I had conversations with him about this, had a, I did, you've got to be a mathematician who loves Paul Dirac's uh, uh, Dirac function. Uh, but this nonlinear dynamics you might have heard about is wandering around uh, 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 chaos theory. And von Neumann and Stan Ulam talking about stellar automata. Again, these probably do not uh, recognize because they are the exotic mathematics attempting to describe the exotic physics. Paul Dirac, Nobel Prize, uh, von Neumann, well, they made the bomb. Uh, and uh, the nonlinear dynamics people are still waiting, the chaos people. Okay, here's how it actually works in cosmology. You start out with a very, very big bang, 10 to the minus 40, 30 seconds, I think, looks like 41 to me. But anyway, that's one and 10 and 41 zeros. In that number of seconds, you had the universe before that was at a very high temperature at uh, 10 to the 34 zeros degrees. And then it cooled and suddenly broke apart into two <laughs> kinds of snowflakes. Those that are called, uh, uh, gravity uh, behaving things, and those that are called uh, three kinds of things, those that are called, uh, well, just two kinds of things. Uh, uh, electro, uh, that's called uh, grand unification things. And then later, the grand unification things broke into three different kinds of uh, butterflies. The weak force butterflies, the electromagnetic force butterflies, and the strong force butterflies. And so as the temperature dropped, there were these symmetry breakings in which we started out with glop, a Higgs field, and we wound up with uh, quarks, with uh, electrons, with neutrinos, and masses. And they were all different, and they all ran by different laws. But back in the beginning, these laws did not apply. These laws did whatever they may be, Nobel Prize for Higgs. Uh, and here's how it applies. So, so the universe goes through these phases where there's the glop made out of this stuff, there's some glop made out of this stuff, and there's some glop made out of this stuff, which we know and love as atoms and, and, and molecules and, uh, and uh, Starbucks. <laughs> and here is the proof bicep screwed it up, but anyway, this is that kind of student at the South Pole chasing pins and whatever he can, looking at the radio waves coming from empty space and measuring the temperatures uh, of, the, uh, of the thing that gave off these radio waves, the Big Bang, and put little dots here. Uh, different temperature dots, the difference in temperatures between whatever gave us that dot and that dot, it's about a millionth of a Kelvin. So that's a snapshot of the baby universe as it was already forming. And these dots eventually collected into tribes, these tribes eventually into, into uh, galaxies, and those galaxies eventually collected in uh, uh, bundles of galaxies and voids. Oh boy, are these voids fun. Uh, okay. Other kinds of things. So we're going to go from analog mathematics to digital mathematics, a different game. Stan Lu uh, inventing this idea that you could take uh, uh, pixels and you could uh, add rules to them and you put the pixels on the screen and then you say all of these pixels obey a rule. They're going to change and they're going to change so if two of these guys uh, are like each other, they'll make a baby. But if these two guys don't, they'll make up some kind of a formation rules. Press a button and turn it loose. This is sometimes called the game of life. It's a very popular. Uh, uh, Game for those who like to play with computers. 
And uh, so you put down some rules and put down dots and they evolve. These drag dots into these and these dots into these. And eventually, oops, sometimes they into these. And we're saying, aha, evolution. Uh, that, but there's nothing in these rules that tell you about these rules. This tree has birds that poop and grows and gives branches and so on. And these things are just pixels and picks. So again, emergence, the emergence of one kind of science from, or one kind of language of science from another kind of language science with no quite understanding of why this and not something else. <laughs> oh, there's the rule, by the way. And other people talk about symmetry making biology, how two cells, a bunch of cells and goop can get together and make organisms, and uh, uh, symmetry breaking in syntax, how language, the new language, the, the, uh, the unhygienic language works with, with, with grammars and uh, grammars and uh, syntaxes which are ambiguous, not particularly logical or classifiable. This is a new move in, uh, in linguistics. What's next? Oh, now, okay. Now, the idea is now, this general notion of emergence, maybe we can, as we did, or as they did when they looked at, or uh, they didn't look at Einstein and Bohr and Heisenberg's physics, so they came up with this bizarre, simplistic view of the scientific method. Maybe if we look closely, not at Bohr and Einstein and those guys, they're dead anyway, but we look at the what the working physics is doing and see if we can construct some, some kind of, uh, of philosophy of science and of uh, of, of understanding of the epistemology that may uh, restore the relevance of philosophy to science, or not. So I go back to show you what the problem is from Phil Anderson's uh, argument at 72 science, and he talks about the problem of reduction, uh, about the idea, the ability to reduce everything to simple fundamental laws, and the problem is it does not imply you can start from those laws and reconstruct the universe. The constructionist hypothesis breaks down when confronted with the difficulties of scale and complexity. Each level of complexity, a new property is a mirror, and the understanding of the new behaviors requires research, which is fundamental to any other. I got a prize for it. That is, it seems to me that one may array the science as a hierarchy. Elements of, elements of science X obey the laws of science Y. The elements are solid state physics, chemistry, molecular cell biology, psychology. These, uh, these are Okay, the laws of particle physics, antibody physics, chemistry, molecular, and physics, and there's no way to derive these from those, or those from these, as he said somewhere. He said, uh, this hierarchy does not imply that science X is just applied Y. At each stage, new laws, concepts, and general instances are necessary and required. Mm -hmm. That psychology is not applied biology, nor is biology applied chemistry. It just isn't. You go to, and that's why the chemists can't understand the biologists and the psychologists can't understand uh, anybody. And uh, <laughs> E.S. Kuhn falls on his face, banging his head on the floor and saying, oh, that's incommensurability for you. Uh, uh, okay. Here is somebody who read that work, uh, so in Schroeder in 93, uh, talking about condensed matter physics, uh, gave us examples for this renormalization group method. This is just from snazzy modern mathematics. We need to recognize the growth of scientific knowledge. The Kuhnian model will no longer do. Let's take that, non coin I am the barbarians are today. <laughs> uh, to a remarkable degree, our detailed theories of elementary particle interactions can be understood deductively if concepts of symmetry principles and renormalizable by, by Stephen Weisberg. And these are principles, not laws. They are what I call taxonom taxonomic theories, classification theories. We can draw class classify the animals. We have no idea why they should be classified that way and no other way. And the reduction of approach as a hallmark of theoretical buzz in the 20th century is super study by the study of emergent phenomena. Here are some new players in the game. Uh, and she's not all that new, but uh, Mary Hesse in her book on forces and fields, probably 20 years ago, she's still alive, suggested a scientific methodology based on an analogical modeling approach that is consider the, not theories, but models. Wittgenstein, a nice book uh, called Wittgenstein Flies a Kite, where he was, uh, he was an engineer and he was trying to understand in the uh, 1910s and 20s aircraft wings. So he'd make a little model of a wing and he'd a uh, kite and he'd fly it and see how the kite flew and then do an airplane and see how the airplane uh, flew. And he was weird about 
what's the relationship between the model and the airplane? Well, there are things in the model that are not in the airplane, and there are things in the airplane that are not in the model. Einstein actually designed a wing, they call it the uh, humpback wing, uh, for the uh, in German Air Force in World War I, and they build it and they crash. Uh, okay, uh, there's Richard Falkenberg, a particle physics and a uh, heavy metal philosopher. And she asking how is cosmology possible? As an empirical science, well, uh, the phenomena are finite parts of the sensible world, but the universe is the idea of an intelligible world and regular principles. And this doesn't, these things don't connect. And so she mentions, well, actually, if we go back to Kant and his idea of, uh, of what can be known, understood, uh, due to the, due to the uh, hardware in our head and what is outside of it uh, and their relationships, we're doing quite well until these positivists remain to us. Uh, this is what I call return of metaphysics. Serge Klar wrote a new book on, uh, on how classical physics morphed into uh, uh, quantum mechanics um, uh, in a very uh, butterfly sort of way. Uh, and uh, then this book, uh, just recently out, Made in Poor, uh, collects articles on showing that metaphysics can and should be naturalized. By naturalized, he meant conducted as a part of natural science. So, Lady and Poor, this is uh, uh, last year. Uh, I like he writes an old car and a new car, uh, and argues that this is a metaphysical transformation. And to finish up, uh, I have simply suggested in, uh, in terms of the, how this business of metaphysics, scientific metaphysics, uh, not necessarily copying emergence, but, uh, but understanding the difference between emergence and causality. And uh, so looking at the things we lost in positivism, what's going to replace them in the 22nd century philosophy? So rather than theories, we have models, heuristics, and analogy. Einstein, uh, uh, Mary Hess, and uh, Wittgenstein. Instead of belief, we have Elzat. This is a trick by Hans Weihinger, a editor of Kant, who told us that he was a theologian, and he said uh, something along the lines of uh, Kant. Uh, and he said, that, well, you know, it's, there's no way of knowing that whether a deity exists. Uh, that, that's simply a, not, a, not, a, not an intelligent question or an answer. That's, a, that's blurry. Uh, but it makes sense to act as if one did. Like, it makes sense to Einstein. There's no such thing as a photon, but it makes sense to act as if there was. Because if there were, we can find quantum theory, we can get beam theory, we can get to the art theory. There's no such thing as symmetry breaking, but if we pretend al means as if. The world behaves as if. There were these uh, 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 cocoons, and there were butterflies, and there were rules to break them, then we can understand the difference between belief in a theory and understanding of a heuristic explaining that theory. Rather than A causes B, in quantum mechanics we have tendencies. If I hits the ball, he has a tendency to make a home run, but you know, sometimes he doesn't. Electrons mostly will behave sensibly. They all go into our, uh, in our brain and kick off our little neurons, but in statistics they're always the loners. There will be, when you look at a Bohr atom, all the atoms are, electrons are supposed to be here, but one out of every 38 are somewhere else. If you look at my bouncing off this wall, uh, according to quantum mechanics in Heisenberg, every time I hit this wall, I bounce back. So I just need to bounce back. One out of every 380 times, I'm going to be here. It's going to be here. I'm, I'm going to transition to here, and it's not going to be there. I'm going to go through. Quantum tunneling, just an effect, no thought process all around. So we look at instead of causalities, we have tendencies or probabilities. Instead of truth, as, I, as Hopper pointed out, we'll have explanatory adequacy. Instead of language, we'll have hermeneutics. Now, this is, uh, this is a, a, a postmodern idea, but it's simply what a hermeneutics are is storytelling. It's, uh, it's, uh, you can't, I can't tell you what I'm talking about. I can show you. I'll tell you the story. Once upon a time, there was a Freddie Air. And then and he, uh, he fought the f and then, and then, and, and then you know, we've been telling you stories. These aren't true. Well, unless I tell them true, I was there. But, uh, but in any case, that is the point of view that, that, that Plato said in the, uh, in the, uh, Tome uh, in the Timaeus about Atlantis is, I can't tell you the truth. I can't. It, it's not tellable. There's no way. And truth is something that, that is not a human capacity. So what I'm going to do is tell you a story. 
and I tell you the story, which is a myth, it's heuristic, but you will come to know what I'm talking about. Not by what I, by parsing what I say, but getting the point. And some of you in the literature and the humanities know quite well, well, we always have been telling you that, you're just not listening. <laughs> then uh, in, instead of uh, logic, we have, this is my own invention, this is a, this is a uh, framework of a, of, of a fuzzy logic or a uh, uh, objective logic, I won't go into it. And instead of universality, we have this idea of domain context autonomy. So those are just hints at, uh, at what I'm talking about. And what I said was, as, as Jesse said, I said um, that uh, physics has run ahead of the philosophers, but if the philosophers want to catch up, they might look at the humanists <laughs> and uh, start uh, looking at, hey, they did not do so bad. That works. <laughs> what they're doing works. People respond. They understand what they're talking about. I don't. Uh, they understand what a poet is talking about. They understand what an artist is saying. They all stand there looking and say, yeah, I got it. Uh, and maybe, maybe uh, that if, if we build a philosophy based on their sense of, of I'll call it reality of the human experience, uh, we got a shot. Thank you. Dr. Kidd, thank you so much. We have uh, a little time for Q&A, so I want to turn the uh, floor over to the audience, and um, we have a mic that's a little low, so can you hear me from the mic? Any cues going through? How about some cues? I got some A's. <laughs> <laughs> You just have to collect your thoughts for a moment there, right? <laughs> That's quite a lot to take in. Um, can I tell them the backstory of how I asked you to come out here? We had this thing about Neil deGrasse Tyson. I, I oh, yes, 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 so yes, yes. I was so interested. I mean, what happened was, um, I, I'm having trouble with this mic, so we're just going to um, let my voice carry. So uh, I, I called Dr. Skip up uh, a while back, several uh, a couple months ago. We we talked about um, why well, I mentioned I, I kind of had a problem because I had uh, this you know this thing Neil deGrasse Tyson. You guys know who that is, Neil deGrasse Tyson? The he's the, he's the new host of the Oz Post Reborn. Steve likes him. I stopped liking him a while ago. But Neil deGrasse Tyson was my hero a few months ago. Then he said something a while back. You know he said. He was on his show, on a different show of his, and he said, uh, well, yes, what did you major in college? The guy said, philosophy. Well, that's what's going to get you into trouble, because philosophy is always asking questions and never coming up with any answers, and that could literally lead one astray in life and send you off the deep end and send you into some real mess. It's not like you're going to go to hell if you're a philosopher. So I, I'm a kind of poet who's teaching philosophy here in many ways. I have a background in poetry and philosophy, but, but I, I, I thought, well, you know, maybe we could kind of, um, you know, talk about this, and uh, uh, Dr. Skip asked, well, should we have a sort of a, you want me to do a lecture on kind of why philosophy matters, and philosophy matters for the lecture. I knew immediately that that was not a good idea for me to kind of uh, assent to that. So uh, I, I thought, let's just let him talk about what he wants to talk about. And we, we, we came to this place where really, um, in the discussion, we're really kind of realizing, uh, I was, well, I came to the realization that um, Dr. Skip had a perspective on how bankrupt philosophy has become. Philosophy has become uh, to, to sit, it, it's come to talk about algorithms, formulas. So it was a um, certainly a position of the logical positivists of the turn of the century that if you couldn't express it in a mathematical language, then it was nonsense. That was basically the consensus among the logical positivists. But at a certain point, we're, we're reaching a place where my question for you today, and I guess I, I'm not sure if it's a good question, but I'm just going to ask it, is. Um, one of the things that comes up when, you, when, you, when we start talking about um, bees having an intelligence or ants having an intelligence that the individual ant doesn't have, the collective intelligence, or people driving in a roundabout, a traffic circle, sort of know what to do, even though it's a pain in the butt to drive in a traffic circle. There are fewer car accidents, apparently, in traffic circles than in an intersection with the traffic lights, okay? Or the stock market sort of seems to have a mind of its own. Some of these things seem to unfold. And the question, it's an uncomfortable question, is what actually does distinguish this from magic? That's well, you, uh, you can help off, us. let me correct you. When, I, when I'm bashing on the logical positivists, that's known as analytic philosophy. 
uh, uh, and that is Anglo-American philosophy. Sure. And, it's, and a lot of philosophy is left over. Something called continental philosophy, which is not any of that. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Husserl and Heidegger and, uh, and my old teacher, Hannah Arendt, I spoke to the existentialist and so on. There is, there is, uh, there is an enormous amount of philosophizing going around here that doesn't make these mistakes of copying science. Unfortunately, they don't also talk about science very much. Uh, they look like okay, it didn't work out. Uh, and uh, thus, if you want to ask these metaphysical questions, you can't ask a positive. You can't ask uh, in which they fix, they fix the way I want to do. So you got to ask uh, the, the you have to ask the uh, continental philosophers when you're talking about uh, uh, does the collective have a uh, consciousness that is different than the individual? Well, one is reminded of uh, Karl Jaspers, uh, Karl Jaspers' book *Reason and Existence*, where uh, he's talking about. Uh, well, you know, you look at something this way, and you look at something this way, and you look at it again this way, and you look at it again this way, and you all think all the reasons of thing is, and at some point you'll encounter it, and some point you'll have it, uh, a sense that what's going on. He, uh, almost like Jung, talks about the collective unconscious, the cloud, the where it just speaks of the cloud. Uh, the way uh, somebody put it, I think it was uh, uh, in, a, what I'm thinking of, uh, um, uh, Leibniz. Uh, Leibniz and his view of, uh, of the truth and the individual. And the idea of you, you have the sun shine there and you break a mirror and you look at all the pieces. All of those pieces are different, but it's the same sun. Now that's a, uh, uh, in other words, that's, that's the, kind of, the kind of picture. Now I, I, that particular picture does not correspond to the picture I'm talking about for the free breaking, but it gets, it gets the idea that there are people who are able to get these ideas across, or not answer the questions, but look at look at phenomena from that point of view and find some level of understanding. That's about ten percent of American philosophers, though. I think. I mean, in other words, who can you, you, can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't get a job as an American um, in American philosophy departments as easily unless you're an analyst these days. That might be changing. Well, that's said. changing a lot. Yeah. I was, yeah. Yeah. I've been invited to several yeah. institutions to comment, but it is. But Galileo's fight was not with the church; it was with the university. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, the pigeon league, the Aristotelians, the uh, people following uh, Saint Thomas, and uh, even Russia, or whatever it is, is on the left. These people who. Have, uh, have their own uh, particular uh, uh, logic or rhetoric about physical sciences. And Galileo thought differently than they, and, uh, and uh, uh, but, but, uh, but unfortunately the universities, uh, run particularly by Jesuits, were all admired in this uh, antique and failing philosophy of heroism. And, um, and uh, so he went up against them. He said, you know, you guys are doing it wrong. Uh, I, uh, and uh, since uh, their patrons in the church didn't like it, they, uh, they, they got into trouble. But the thing about universities or colleges, community colleges, is the people who run them tend to like to talk about reliable things. They don't want to tell their students something that might be really looky goosey them. So they rely on things that are well established. I would wager that's 80% of the philosophy of science courses in this nation, certainly my university, are in the old style pos Anglo-American positive because they're Anglo-American schools. Because those allegedly had traction somewhere in the founding days of, of science. They were, they were ratified or, 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 or justified by people like Einstein and Bohr. The fact that that is not historically accurate uh, is uh, what Kuhn points out about weak science. But, um, uh, and, and so uh, it's been 40 years since Mary Hesse uh, operated. It's only been a few years since uh, Lady Moon Poor are talking, but uh, Mary, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, How the Laws of Physics Lie, Mary, I should have a genius award, but anyway, uh, she's won several MacArthur awards for, what's her name? I'll see you in a moment here. But uh, there are, as I showed you in the slide, uh, in, in these years, there are people now talking about the metaphysics of science. So in about 20 to 30 years, I won't be here, but uh, that may become, hopefully, they hope, it, as the Stanford School hopes, that they will be able to dig out of this scheme. But for now, uh, it's, it's simply uh, too, too soon 
in the revolution to expect a large uh, a lot of disadvantaged audience. Yes. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Hadley. I teach physics here. Oh. oh. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. No, I've enjoyed this very much. <laughs> I've enjoyed it very much. Um, but I had a couple of questions, but I'll ask just one to start off with. Uh, when I was at Fairfield University my first year in college, we discussed, uh, I think it was St. Thomas Aquinas' five proofs for the existence of mm -hmm. God. Was that Aquinas? Yeah. Yeah, five ways. Yeah, and one was unmoved mover, uncaused yeah. cause, the orderliness of the universe. Yeah. How do you feel about any of that? Do you think it proves anything? No, I think they're crazy interesting. Okay. So they, they just told you what 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 what, uh, what uh, Aquinas and Arrow thought. This is well, this is that thing. You know, if you if you as if the universe was first that way, you'll probably be in, in great shape if you happen to be in their community. Can you conclude anything from it? That there is a can I conclude that a very smart fellow had these very good ideas <laughs> that, according to Kuhn, when he read them, he said, oh, they're not wrong, they're just different. And for those people, uh, mm -hmm. if, of course, P.S. again, uh, that, that, was, that was good. It went for them. They, uh, they, they got jobs and tenure. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, for us, um, well, I, I think those are good ideas. I, I operate on what's called a, the fire oven trick. That according to Tom Cohn, uh, that these, these ideas uh, that people have uh, eventually break down and they have to replace the new ideas, which then the old ideas have thrown away. Uh, we unlearn what we used to learn and now we learn something new and we keep our unlearn. And then that system breaks down and we learn something new and unlearn that. And I said, what if we take the ideas that were, that were attacked by the previous generation and recycle them to the new generation? So I've been busy, I don't go back to Aristotle. Well, I really do, I go back to Kant. And I'm bringing back now the whole, the whole uh, archi uh, the architectonic of Kant, which is to some extent based on actually Aristotle and Plato's uh, divided line and all that kind of stuff. So are those, uh, can you understand something that has to change? At least I can. But you have to take those structures and put them in these new contexts. I, I still teach Newton's law of gravity, even though it's been replaced by yes. general relativity. And much, yes. um, and, and it's much more complicated. It's hard to talk about tensor yeah. physics. Yeah. You know, right. So you need to bring it down to a lower level, and it works well. Yeah. You know, so, so, do you, so why would you do anything else? But it's a paradigm shift. It's Whose paradigm has it shifted? How many people do we know that, uh, that GR, I teach GR, uh, and I teach them three people. I can't get students to study it. <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, sure, it's a paradigm shift. If you assume the, but this paradigm, you know, the one state said there are only 12 people on the same GR. Somebody asked Eddie, so why are you crying? He says, well, there's me and there's Einstein. What's going on? <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, and uh, so. Well, that, that was my PhD, yeah. actually, it was general relativity. Yeah, that's not what I'm doing now. I said the two dimensional black hole model. Who would believe it? It's flat. Flat, yeah. yeah, but, but it's all true. So if a paradigm shifts in the forest, the black hole is If a paradigm shifts in the forest and no one's there, does it make sound? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, because they, that's what these messages are in the ground. Is there any end to that? Well, sorry, no. Is there a truth at the end? No. Absolutely not. <laughs> that would be a super paradigm. That would be everybody is on the same boat. Right. Ha, ah, good luck. Uh, look at the last one. <laughs> uh, so that, no, that, I don't think there are paradigms, and neither, none of these people do. But well, shouldn't there be a truth? Independent of us. Well, what would we make of it? If somebody told us that, what would we hear? I mean, the X file says the truth is out there. Yes, that it's out there, it's not in here. So, you know, if, if, if you said, what would a being that thought differently than we is, an alien comes down and it just thinks different ways, it mentions them, what would he make of it? I would probably think it's a rock. <laughs> that that, that I, I, I would not go back to it. It has nothing in common. And so that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about. There are no global paradigms, universal laws. There are things that work for people, like, like Newton worked for Newton things, and GR works for GR things. And uh, next year, we'll have other things that work. Yeah, that's it. Doesn't matter. It's a good idea. I love the idea. I worked there many years because of its tensor. It's a great idea. It just doesn't have to be useful in physics. Right. 